go ahead and turn to a couple of places in the Bible. Revelation chapter 2 and 1 Kings chapter 16. We're also going to be in chapter 18 and a little bit in 19. So you, you can be there. Follow along. Revelation 2, 1 Kings 16, a little bit in 18 and 19. We're going to continue in our study through the seven letters that Jesus tells John to write to the seven churches there in Revelation. We're on letter number four, written to the church of Thyatira. Okay. Now this morning, this is going to be a little different than the way that we've approached the um, last three letters. Okay. Um, normally we would read the letter and then go back and study a bit, but for this one, I want to study as we go and see how far we get. Let's start with this whole sermon in one sentence. And that's this. The devil's deputy will disrupt you if you don't deal with her deceit. The devil's deputy will disrupt you if you don't deal with her deceit. Deceit. That's going to make more sense as we go. The title of this message this morning is Lay Down the Law. Lay Down the Law. Jesus starts and he says, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write. Let me just say that in some ways, Thyatira is just like the other cities that we've looked at, these other letters, these other cities. They worshiped pagan gods and idols, temples everywhere. Thyatira was actually very small, but it was still a very prosperous um, trading town. The whole town was built upon uh, trading guilds. Okay, what is a guild? Think um, labor union. Some of you may have had jobs or still have jobs, and you're part of a union. Okay, every craft had its own guild. The bronze smiths, the silver smiths, the people that made clothing, in fact, Thyatira was famous for dyeing garments. Something about the water in the city of Thyatira made it possible to create really deep purple and even red dyes for the clothing. You might remember in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16, Paul, Timothy, Silas, they were sharing the gospel with a group of ladies there and they had gathered in. And it says that among those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth, cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. And it goes on and says that she and her household had been baptized. Pretty cool. Look at how Jesus introduces himself to the church of Thyatira. The son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and feet like burnished bronze says this. Now this is super important. Jesus says, I have eyes like fire. I want you to think x-ray vision. Okay. He sees through everything. With supernatural discernment, Jesus can see the deep places where darkness and impurity hide. And regardless of what he sees, he won't be moved. He stands firm on his own two feet, which are burnished bronze. Now, you need to know that in Scripture, oftentimes, most times, bronze is symbolic of judgment. In 2 Timothy 4, 8, Paul says that the, Jesus is the righteous judge and that we will all stand before him on the day of judgment. So Jesus is saying, don't think I don't see. Don't think I won't judge. And then he goes on in ver, uh, verse 19, he says, I know your deeds and your love and your faith and your service and your perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than they were at first. Now think about what he's saying. This could only mean one thing. Your deeds of late are better than they were at first. In other words, Thyatira was killing it. They just kept getting better and kept getting 
bigger. Sharing the gospel, making disciples, overcoming obstacles. They were killing it. You understand what I'm saying? Verse 20, he says, but I have this against you. That you tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. And she teaches and leads my bond servants astray so that they commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel. Okay, who was this woman, Jezebel? I believe that she was at least one person, okay? Possibly a woman, may have even been a man, or both. Could have been more than one person. People who were operating under the influence of a very familiar, evil, and powerful spirit. The name Jezebel has a very strong negative association, just like Judas, right? If someone betrays you, you might call them a Judas, right? Remember the scriptures tell us that Satan entered into Judas and Judas goes straight to the chief priests and sells Jesus out, tells them where Jesus was going to be. And when they find him, Jesus, uh, Judas is with them and he comes up to Jesus and he betrays him with a kiss, just as sweet as he can be betrays Jesus with a kiss. But even then, Jesus had eyes of fire and could see right through the act. Let me say it this way. Jezebel is a demonic power sent by Satan himself to control and dominate. This spirit works specifically through people. Male or female, doesn't matter. Remember, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 to put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Against the schemes. Your translation may say against the wiles or the tactics. To stand firm against the strategies of the devil. This spirit of Jezebel, in my opinion, is one of Satan's most gifted soldiers. And I don't want you to get weird just because I'm saying that there are specific spirits assigned by Satan. Don't get weird about that. Okay. He goes on in this very same chapter and says, our struggle isn't against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, against the forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. There are forces of darkness that wreak havoc in their own way whenever or wherever they are assigned. Satan had assigned to the church of Thyatira the same power, the same force of wickedness that he assigned to a woman in the Old Testament, a woman named Jezebel. 1 Kings chapter 16 There's no way we could read the whole story, just take forever. But look at verse 31. It says, it came about as though it had been a trivial thing for King Ahab, king of Israel at the time, to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. As though it had been a trivial thing. It came about as though it had been a trivial thing for King Ahab to walk in the sins of Jeroboam. Jeroboam was a previous king who had built altars. He had built high places. He had constructed golden calves, and then he led people to worship these false gods and these idols. As if that wasn't bad enough, Ahab comes along and continues all that. He just keeps it going. And he marries a woman named Jezebel. Verse 31, 1 Kings 16 verse 31 says, it came about as though it had been a trivial thing for King Ahab to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the sons of Naboth, that he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went to serve Baal and worshiped him. 
Ethbaal, Jezebel's father, Ethbaal, means with Baal. Ethbaal was the king of the Sidonians, but he was originally a priest of Asherah, the Phoenician goddess of fertility, also called Ishtar, which is where we get the word Easter. His daughter's name was Jezebel. Now listen, Jezebel is actually a word used in Baal worship to cry out to Baal. People that were worshiping Baal would cry out, Jezebel, Jezebel, which means where is Baal? It was a way of invoking Baal. A few key things you would see in the worship of Baal are sexual perversion, no surprise, gender change, and child sacrifice. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, these are issues that we're dealing with today, but they're actually old issues. We're just seeing familiar forces of darkness. Now, Jezebel was an awful woman. Awful. She was infamous for her idolatry and sorcery, for her cruelty. Jezebel was a cruel woman. She was known for her filthiness. In fact, Zebel, Jezebel, Zebel at some point became a pun in the Hebrew culture for poop. It's okay to laugh. We had a good laugh about it last night. Zebel became a pun for poop. You might tell somebody, oh, you're so full of Zebel. <laughs> right? So why would Ahab marry this piece of Zebel? <laughs> why would he do that? Because he thought it would be a good political move. But instead, it provoked God, and in the end, this brought destruction upon Israel because Jezebel seduced Ahab. She bewitched him. He became confused. Ahab didn't know if he was coming or going. He was eventually unable to distinguish between right and wrong. 1 Kings chapter 18 tells us that the prophet Elijah went to confront Ahab for all the bulls the bell that was going on. And most of us know the scene. We're familiar with this whole scene. First Kings 18, starting in verse 18, says, Elijah says, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and you have followed the Baals, now then send orders and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Elijah gives nearly a thousand false prophets an opportunity to display the power of their God. None of them could do it. None of them. Elijah just looks at them, shakes his head, and says, much to learn still you have. Walks up to the altar like Yoda and calls fire down from heaven. Verse 37, it says, hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. And then the fires of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust. And it licked up all the water that was in the trench. Now, when all the people saw this, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. They say it twice. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. And so they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. The next chapter picks up with 1 Kings 19. 
Ahab telling Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sends a messenger to Elijah. Now let me stop and say this is what Jezebel does. Jezebel sends a message through a messenger. Messenger in Hebrew is to dispatch as a deputy. That's what it means. To dispatch as a deputy. It means one with the power and the authority to represent. This word in the scriptures is also used when talking about prophets. It can be used when talking about priests or teachers. It's been used in the scripture to talk about angels. Okay, my point is, this person who delivers this message wasn't Satan. It wasn't even Jezebel. It may not have even been a woman. It may not have even been a bad person but was able to deliver the message as though it came from Satan himself. And what was the message? Verse 2, Then Jezebel, Jezebel sends a message to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. In other words, I'm going to kill you. And this is where it gets weird. It also shows just how powerful the influence of Jezebel can be. Verse 3 says, Then, after Elijah receives this message, then Elijah was afraid. And he rose and ran for his life. You tell me, how does a man who does what no man has ever done before, calls fire down from heaven, puts 850 false prophets to shame, and then kills the other half. How does someone like that become so overwhelmed with fear that he runs for his life? Let me remind you of what we've already said. Jezebel is a demonic power sent by Satan himself to control and dominate. This spirit works specifically through people, male or female. And let me tell you who she targets. Leaders. Anyone with influence. Could be an amazing mom or dad. Could be someone that's a great boss. Satan will assign Jezebel to anyone he perceives is a threat to his agenda. And this is why his primary target is the church. And that's the angle that I'm going to take to describe just how she is able to wreak havoc. However, as we begin talking about some of this, your eyes may be opened to how this spirit may be working somewhere or somehow in your own life. Verse 20, Revelation 2, Jesus says, But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Sexual immorality and idolatry aren't so, much, uh, aren't so much what she was teaching, but rather where her teaching will ultimately lead someone to. Okay, think about what these two things are, sexual immorality. It's the distortion of intimacy with God. Think about what idolatry is. It's seduction away from God. And that's her desired destination for every godly person. Because ultimately, it'll disqualify them. It will disqualify them. It will destroy their life and ruin their influence in the kingdom. 
And she leads them to that place of destruction with her teaching. Let's go ahead and switch perspectives here and talk about someone who is under the influence of a Jezebel spirit. Okay, this is going to help it make a little more sense. Remember how Jezebel sends a malach, a messenger, and that messenger is dispatched as a deputy, someone with the authority to communicate whatever it is that's needing to be communicated. There are people who half the time they don't even know it, but they are acting as one of the devil's deputies endued with the power of Jezebel to disrupt the unity of a church. And I want to show you just how they do it, okay? Now listen, I have literally seen this happen. I have experienced four full-blown Jezebels. Two at the church where Melissa and I were youth pastors and two here at Soma Church. So what I'm telling you is for reals, okay? How Jezebel infiltrates the church. Let's look at these. Number one, assimilation. Assimilation. This person, male or female, will find a church. They will visit long enough to assess the people. Everyone but especially the leader because a full on Jezebel will always work their way to the top, to the pastor. And they have found their church when they perceive that pastor to be a pushover. I'm actually a very easy target because I love people. I meet them. I remember their names. I remember their stories. I don't hide in the green room after I preach. I do my very best to know his sheep in this pasture. And it would be very easy to mistake my meekness for weakness. I'm an easy target. But they also look for pushover people. Members who have levels of influence that they believe can be eventually used to bring division. In fact, one of the very first messages they deliver is, I am very spiritual. I'm so spiritual. Like they imitate the sheep. Jesus warns us of that. Matthew 7, beware of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly. They are ravenous wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Both full-blown Jezebels that I've dealt with at at Soma acted very spiritual. (laughs) Like over-the-top spiritual. I'm like, ain't nobody that spiritual. Come on. You guys know what I'm talking about? Hyper-spirituality. The kind that you're like, you know? (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Beware. Could be a wolf. Assimilation. Number two, manipulation. Manipulation. Now remember, the whole point is to gain control, to dominate. And it takes a while to get positioned to have that kind of controlling influence. But you got to start somewhere, right? And so where they usually start is with what I call soft manipulation. Let me give you some examples. They serve. They serve. Serving is is not a bad thing. But with someone with this particular agenda, they understand this to be one of the fastest ways for them to assimilate through serving. But they're serving with an agenda. And that's that's why they will volunteer for as many things as they possibly can. It affirms the facade of their spirituality. Like it helps hide their teeth. You hear what I'm saying? It also creates a sense of indebtedness. 
and indispensability. But look what all I've done for you. Look what I've all, all I've done here. How would you ever even be able to do that without me? <laughs> I've literally heard that. A sheep sees it as serving. A wolf sees it as posturing, positioning. They serve. They flatter. They flatter. They affirm and praise people, but they don't mean it. Affirmation is just another tool for manipulation. Flattery is just a way of tilling up the soil so that in the right season they can plant their seeds of discord. They ask. They ask. Like they want to know all the details about anything. People, positions, processes, history, situations, circumstances, because knowledge is power. Power that they can use to their advantage somewhere down the road. A full, listen to me, a full on Jezebel will hold on to information for years and wait for just the right opportunity to use it. I've seen this. It's shocking. They distort. In their own way, they'll take information that they've gained and they'll begin to sow confusion. They will begin to miscommunicate. They'll begin to misrepresent. And they do it in ways that will sow doubt and discord. They will begin to play both sides of a relationship, especially relationships that are closely connected to the pastor. And when people catch on to what's happening and confront them to bring truth and clarity for the sake of unity, they gaslight. They deny they ever said this or did that. And they shift the blame to someone else or something else instead of just owning their actions. And they are so skilled in this form of manipulation that by the end of the conversation, you're apologizing to them. You're apologizing to them and thanking them. <laughs> it's amazing. But you can only get by with that for so long. In the church, in community, at some point, that Zebel gets called out. <laughs> and when it is, they whine. They whine. They play the role of a victim. They appeal to your compassion. Now, some people do this from the very beginning. They start the whole relationship. Their whole assimilation starts with a sob story because they hope that it will pull your guard down and distract you. Not too terribly long ago, there was a couple that came to Soma and I met them. I said, hi, my name's Tony. My name's so-and-so. Awesome, what brings you here? Oh, well, let me tell you my story. As soon as he said that, my radars went off. And I said, it needs to be the Reader's Digest version. He just looked at me. I knew. I knew something wasn't right. And he goes on to tell his story, and it was a sob of all sob stories. All the things that had happened to him and his wife. and Shared that. He had been in prison for sexual misconduct and some things. I said, okay. And he goes on. And then he starts bashing another church a little bit. I won't have that. Don't start talking to me about Jesus' bride. I don't like that. I watched this couple over about a month. I was already seeing things I didn't like. So I investigated. Turns out this person was 
a registered sex offender who was also attending other churches and already trying to get involved in areas of serving. And you can imagine where. And so I called this gentleman and I said, sir, if you had been honest with me from the beginning, we would have figured out a way for you to be discipled and to grow in your faith here. But because you lied and you bashed the church and there's a few other little things, I said, you are not welcome here. I'm going to ask you to find another church. And when you start looking, I'll help you. But when you start looking, before you even attend, you need to call them and tell them the full extent of your story so that they will know how to serve you. Sob story. Some people start with it. I want you to listen to me, church. We're supposed to be compassionate. Scripture says almost every time Jesus healed, it says he was moved to compassion. But compassion should never skew our perception. We have to have eyes like fire. Discernment. The ability to see below the surface. Amen? And these are just a few subtle forms of manipulation. And when manipulation doesn't work, their tactics don't work. They will take their messaging to a whole nother level. Intimidation. Intimidation. Intimidation is really just a harsher form of manipulation. It's when a wolf will start showing their teeth. When you address some of their uh, soft manipulation or when they're just not getting what they want, they will become more aggressive. They will ghost. They will ghost you. You may not know what that means. What that means is all of a sudden they, that you stop seeing them. They stop coming to services or they stop coming to their small group. You try to call them, but they won't answer. You try to text, but they won't respond. This is passive aggressive, passive aggressive manipulation. They ghost. They accuse. They start accusing, accusing you of this, accusing others of that. Accusation, which you guys know is one of Satan's greatest tools. They start accusing. This is active aggressive manipulation. They will even move to threatening. Threatening to leave the church and leave you in a lurch. I'll, I'll, you, you, won't, you won't have me serving in your thing anymore. You, you, you need me, but I'll leave. <laughs> Cracks me up. They will threaten to share information that they believe will disqualify you. They will try to intimidate you. Are you hearing me this morning? They will intimidate you spiritually. They will use the Bible against you. They will intimidate you mentally. They're usually very smart people, intelligent, highly intelligent, and they will use stuff against you. They will mentally bully you. They will intimidate you emotionally. They will use your own life against you. I'll never forget one of the Jezebels that we had to deal with in the middle of the most bizarre confrontation I have ever experienced in my life. This woman begins accusing our home of being this and being that. Well, you're so busy. You never see your kids. Your kids are in turmoil. Your kids, you remember that? Just going off. I'm like, what are you talking about? You don't know me. You don't know my kids. And I even said, why don't you go ask them if they're in turmoil? They might punch you. <laughs> they wouldn't do that. <laughs> Listen, it's amazing. It's amazing. The lengths that they will go to intimidate. They will try to intimidate you physically. I have had people bow up to me in my face, fighting distance. And you wish that you could just beat the... Zabel out of them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but what do we know? The Apostle Paul says our struggle isn't against flesh and blood, but against rulers, 
against powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now you may be thinking, are you for real? Do these people really exist? 100%. 100%. Several years ago, there was a family that visited our church. And I was coming from my office into, um, into the sanctuary. And people were greeting this family and so I did too. I came up to the husband and said, hey, my name's Tony. He said, hey, my name's so-and-so. I was like, oh, it's so good to meet you. He goes, yeah, I'd like you to meet my wife. And so he kind of turned my attention towards her, and I, I saw her, and I said, hi, my name's Tony. And as soon as I shook her hand, it was like somebody took a gong, cymbals, boom, to my head. And it was like the loudest noise, but it was a word. Jezebel. I mean, what do you do with that, right? Like, is that really your name? You know? I'm not even kidding. Melissa and I were debriefing later that day, and I shared with her. And she said, mm hmm When I met that couple, that lady, the Lord spoke to me and said, not this one. I want to tell you, in 20 years of ministry, I have never had more problems with a person in my life, constantly having to sit in between her and the husband sometimes and other people, mediating conflict after conflict after conflict. Eventually had to bring elders into conflict. This went on for two years. And finally, after the, after you know, so many, I, I sat with them, I had elders in the room and I said, listen, this is the last one. We will not deal with this anymore. If you get into this kind of conflict again, I'm going to ask you to leave. And that's when the teeth started to show and it got bad and it got ugly. And they began working quickly. One more explosion happened, and I didn't even have to call out. They left. And here's what they said to me on their way out. We want you to know that we're leaving the faith, and we have you to thank for that. Okay. Another time, there was a couple that came in. And right from the start, just love bombed us. You guys know what love bombing is? Blessing you, giving you, encouraging you, affirming you, which I like. I like stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go out to a steak dinner. You paying? I'll go. <laughs> you ain't got to ask me twice. But it was constant over and over and over. And I already had my antennas up a little bit. And again, I told you about that strange conversation that we had. And in the end, when I had to sit down and really, really confront all the things, it came down to this. I want to be your number two. I want to lead in the church. He was trying to buy me this whole time. And I said, oh, you thought I was that kind of pastor. I'm not for sale. And you can take all this somewhere else. And they did. When you're dealing with someone influenced by the spirit of Jezebel, you will see so many things working together at one time. Not one thing or this or that, but so many things happening. So many things working at the same time. How does a person get this way? couple things. There's many things. I'll give you four. Traumatic experiences. Traumatic experiences. Can you imagine the emotional trauma on the Jezebel of the Old Testament having to watch children 
as a child, be sacrificed. A little girl watching other little girls and boys being slaughtered, killed, sacrificed on an altar. That's traumatic. And it bends the heart and the mind. All kinds of things can open up a person to that spirit of Jezebel. Sexual abuse. Abandonment. Rejection. Divorce. Betrayal. Any kind of unresolved conflict. All of these things leave you vulnerable to fear and insecurity. Fear of what? Fear of being hurt again. Insecure about experiencing that trauma again. Fear causes us to want to control. We control everything so that my world is safe. So that I am secure. So traumatic experiences. Another thing that can cause this is generational curses. You just come from a family with a history of controlling. You were being controlled just like your mom was controlled by her mom or dad. And hers and hers and goes on and on and on. It's generational. It's just this thing that hasn't been broken in your family. Think about it. Jezebel's father forced her to marry Ahab. I don't know any woman that wants to be told who she has to marry. Right? In what other ways had Ethbaal controlled Jezebel? The occult. The occult is another way. The occult, divination. Uh, scripture talks all about divination. What is divination? It's about gaining information for the purpose of control. Remember, information is power, sorcery, magic, uh, Ouija boards, seances. New Age philosophies. And think about it. The occult is all Jezebel of the Old Testament ever knew. She grew up crying out to Baal. Her very name means cry out to Baal. I remember the gong girl I was telling you about. I did some marriage counseling with them. Go figure. But one of the issues, turns out, was this stuff that had to do with the occult. They were telling me about all of these things. They were arguing about what they, not that one was not and one was. They were both arguing about how they are and something about that. I'm like, why are we even talking about that? It was some weird occultish stuff. And so I had to say, you don't need to be, y'all don't need to be in agreement about anything with that. This is terrible stuff. But that was one of the deals. They had a history with the occult. And turns out when I ruined their faith, they actually went back to the occult. Sexual immorality. Sexual immorality, which makes sense. That's exactly where she's trying to lead people to. So sexual immorality. You need to listen to this. People don't understand the way that sexual immorality is an open door for the enemy. Pornography, wide open door. Sex outside of marriage, you might as well just take the door off the hinges. Adultery, all of those things is a wide open door. It is her mojo. Sexual immorality. Let's keep moving. How to know if you are oppressed by a Jezebel. Let me just say, when you see a lot, I'm going to show you 10 things. When you see a lot of these things working at once, not one or this one or that one here or that one there, because we all experience these things from time to time. But when you see all 10 of these or a, a majority of them working at once, you, you, need, to, you need to stop and listen and, and deal with it. Number one, fear. And I'm talking about irrational fear. Like, whoa, what, are, what is going on with you? Fear. Withdrawal. Like all of a sudden you're just pulling away 
from everything, people, activities. You're just, you're just withdrawing. Isolation, which is similar, but when you withdraw, you withdraw alone. You don't want to be around people. Even though you're a people person, you're an extrovert, you get filled, your tank gets filled with people, but all of a sudden, I just want to be alone. I want to be isolated. Passivity. You just don't stand for the things you used to stand for. You don't, you're not zealous about the things that used to get you fired up. You're just whatever. Depression. Suicidal thoughts. Exhaustion. All of these. We see all these in the story of, of Elijah. Let me show you really quick. Jezebel sent her message and it says Elijah was afraid. And he got up and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. And he left his servant there. Isolation. But he himself went on a day's journey into the wilderness. Withdrawal. And he came and he sat down under a broom tree. He became passive. And he asked for himself to die. Which is a very common desire for someone who is depressed. And then he literally says it, enough, Lord, take my life. He truly was suicidal. For I am no better than my father's. Then he lay down and he fell asleep under a broom tree. But behold, there was an angel touching him and said to him, arise, eat. And he looked and behold, there was his, uh, at his head was a round loaf of Bread baked on hot coals. Don't you love how the Lord will tend to you no matter what? And a pitcher of water. And so he ate and drank. And then he lay down again. Exhaustion. I'm going to show you three more. And you really see these in, in Revelation 2, verse 20. It says, Jezebel, who leads my bondservants astray so that they will commit sexual immorality. And eat things sacrificed to idols. Eat things sacrificed to idols. One of the indicators is discontentment. Now, all of us can find ourselves a little discontent. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about all of a sudden. It's not really who you are, but all of a sudden, you're looking for anything and everything else other than the Lord for your satisfaction. You might want to look into that. Sexual temptation. And I'm talking about more than normal. When all of a sudden you have unusual amounts of sexual temptation and desires and struggle. I've experienced all of these, everything in both of those seasons, all of these. It was so intense. And the last one, number 10 is strange and prolonged sicknesses. Truly, because verse 22, Jesus says, behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. By the way, this is one of the reasons I don't think this was just one person. It says those who commit adultery, unless they repent. I think the Jezebel had a powerful influence over many in the church of Thyatira. Let me add this really quickly. I had someone ask me once, is narcissism the spirit of Jezebel? Because they share a lot of the same behaviors and effects. And you know what? It could very well be because narcissism is like on the rise. You know what I'm talking about? It's one of the prevailing personality disorders of the day. Let me make a quick connection for you. Um, some people believe that the great harlot that you read about in Revelation chapter 17 and some there in 18 is the spirit of Jezebel. But there's theologians and, and teachers and stuff that believe that. And I'll admit, if you read it, it's hard to deny the similar descriptors there. One verse alone is compelling. Verse 4, 
Revelation 17 says that the woman, the great harlot, was dressed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. She held in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. Remember, purple was the most popular color made in Thyatira. Jesus told the church of Thyatira, stop tolerating that woman Jezebel. Thyatira is one of the end times churches there in the book of Revelations. So yeah, maybe, maybe the rise of narcissism is connected to the spirit of Jezebel. Maybe that's what God meant when he told Malachi in Malachi chapter 4. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the father to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Now, we know that John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. Is there another person that's supposed to come and confront spiritual forces of darkness at the time just before Jesus returns? Or could it be that God is saying that his people are going to rise up in the spirit of Elijah and deal with the forces of wickedness in the heavenly places? If so, what do we do? What do we do? How does a church deal with Jezebel? How does a person deal with someone in their life that is narcissistic? And you do have to deal you do have to deal with it. Jesus said, if you don't deal with her, I'm going to deal with you. Isn't that what we read? I want to give you some scriptural and practical things. Uh, how, we'll call it this, how to deal with a spirit of Jezebel. Number one, recognize how it got in. Recognize how it got in. Are there any fears? that you carry, any anxieties, any areas of bondage, any hurts or wounds, any areas of unforgiveness in your life, any trauma that is still affecting your heart and mind, anything that the enemy could be using to manipulate you, and listen, the only way that you will be able to recognize it is to seek the Lord in prayer, to seek the Lord in prayer and seek counsel from godly men and women. But it's something that you definitely want to do. Recognize how it got in. Number two, repent for every open door. Repent. Repent for every open door. Whatever got in and, and, you know, now the spirit is working against you and you let it happen or it's operating in you and you're cooperating with it. Listen, everyone has been controlling and everyone has been controlled. Isn't that right? Jesus said, behold, I will throw her on a, sick, a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. Unless they repent. You know, he, Jesus gave Jezebel an opportunity to repent, but she just would not repent of her immorality. Like, would not. I will not repent of that. Jesus always gives an opportunity to repent. Remember, that's the narrative of the scriptures. That is what he has authored. And forgiveness is found in the person and work of Christ. Amen? Of course, there's an opportunity to repent. And that's what we need to do. We need to repent for every open door. I remember after the season of the Gone Girl, it was brutal. It was brutal because it was two years of tolerating. Two years, which is actually unlike me to tolerate something that long. Two years, and it was brutal, and it, it brought in others. It wasn't just her and that family. 
Then it just started bombarding us from everywhere. It was a brutal season. And finally, we, we dealt with it. We stopped tolerating it. I told you how we dealt with her. And then we had to deal with a few other people. Lots of conflict. Lots of conversations. And then it was like the last one was removed and gone. And the Lord said, you're not done. It's like, there's more. And he reminded me of Revelation chapter 2. Repent. And so I got down on my face in my office. And I began crying out to the Lord, asking him for forgiveness. Lord, forgive me for tolerating that woman, Jezebel. And I felt this weight lifting. Just lift it. Lift it right up. It was an awesome experience. But I still wasn't done. Because step three is refuse to let it in again. I'll be dang if the next week someone didn't come into the church and my radars went off. The Lord was testing me. Were you really serious about it? Yes, sir, I'm serious. I'm, I'm for reals. And I watched like I try to do over the course of a couple of weeks, and it was just not right. And so we had a conversation. They were already starting to display divisive behavior, bashing Jesus' bride. This is not your church. That's not how we roll. I'm going to ask you to find another church. I will help you, but let me give you some steps on how to effectively assimilate into a church. The next week, <laughs> I'm not even kidding. There's a family that came in, and within just 30 seconds of speaking with this family, my radars were going off so loud, I'm surprised they didn't hear it. <laughs> and I was praying through it, Lord, am I discerning right? Because you know there's a fine line with the prophetic gifts. There's a fine line between discernment and judgment. It's a razor's edge. And you have to seek the Lord. Am I just judging or am I discerning? And so in prayer, Lord, Lord, Lord. And I have to tell you, within a couple of days, the Lord confirmed in five powerful ways, this family never needs to come back to your church. It's an amazing story. And so before the next weekend, I got in contact with them and I said, for this reason, I'm going to ask you to never come to Soma again. And boy, did the teeth start to show. And they only proved that I wasn't judging. I was discerning. And I felt the Lord's approval. Not that it's a fun thing to have to have that kind of conversation but the Lord wants a healthy church. The Lord wants a safe church. Do you understand what I'm saying to you, saints? It's worth the conversation. Refuse to let it in again. You have to lay down the law with the authority that God's given you in your life. Jesus said, but I have this, this against you that you tolerate that woman Jezebel. Tolerate means to allow one to have their way. That's what it means. To allow them to do what they're doing. Jesus said, I don't want you to tolerate that. In the verse 24, he goes on. He says, I, I place no other burden on you. No other burden. You just deal with the woman Jezebel. Stop tolerating it. Repent and stop. I place no other burden on you. You guys are killing it. All I got to tell you about is that woman, Jezebel. Stop tolerating it. Lay down the law. Deal with it. Repent and move on. And listen, as that relates to the church, but also maybe someone in your life that displays these types of characteristics. And call it what you want. It may not necessarily be a Jezebel or full on this or that. 
But maybe something that you got out of this morning is, holy cow, I need to set some boundaries. I need to set some boundaries in this relationship. Maybe that's something the Lord is speaking to you. Maybe, maybe this whole sermon for you is meant to confirm something that the Lord has been speaking to you and maybe giving you some tools on why and how. And I hope that's the case. I want you to bow your head and let's spend a minute just listening to the Holy Spirit. Lord, we trust that we are in this place in the scriptures this week because it's something that we need to know, that we need to hear. We're trusting that you wrote this to the church of Thyatira, not just for them, but for us today. We're trusting that the same Lord who had eyes of fire and when is able to see through and feet of bronze is standing with us and for us and gives us the ability to see and to discern, to understand. And so we ask right now that you would forgive us for any way that we've tolerated anything that comes from people who are trying to oppress and come against and bring division and bring us down. Forgive us for the doors that we may have allowed to be opened. We repent and we shut those doors right now. We shut the doors that we've opened and we ask that you would forgive us for allowing that spirit to come against us like that. We also ask for forgiveness in any way that spirit has operated in us. Forgive us for being controlling, domineering, manipulative. It's not your heart. It's not your way. And Lord, we do together commit to refuse to let that in again. But we know that's hard, so we ask for you to fill us with your Holy Spirit, that your divine power would give us what we need in this specific area. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.